You may be seated. Thanks for to you, Brother Borders. It's certainly a grand privilege to be here in San Jose tonight. I might say that this was my first invitation to California, and I've been 14 years getting here. I've been all around everywhere else, but finally get to San Jose. And I heard that was going to get to come this time. It certainly thrilled my heart. For there was some pastor here, perhaps on the platform tonight, that gave me the first invitation 14 years ago, and my first one. So I've, I've looked around on the map, and over I've been to Fresno and around rim firing it, and just got here. You know, they always say the best is last. Is that say the best to last? Is that what it is? The dessert. Look to this nice audience tonight. So. Uh, great anticipations on your faces, looks like. You're looking for something to happen. Then I am believing this is the Lord has saved last to best. We have just closed a great meeting down to the Angelus Temple, and we had a wonderful time down there. The Lord did bless us and give us hundreds of souls, great testimonies of all kinds, wheelchairs, cops. A young colored girl was called in the meeting, and I believe I have her testimony over there that she had two tumors that turned to cancer, one on each side, that the doctor uh, could not touch. It was done past that, and within two days, the same doctor could find nothing of them at all. They were gone. So it's just to show that our Lord still is Lord, that he still rules and reigns. So happy for that. Now. It's too bad we just have three days. I wish we just had three weeks or four weeks or something so we could really have a, a great time together. Now, I'm so glad to hear that all this fine cooperation of all the different pastors, different uh, the Church of God, Assemblies of God, and all, all of them, every, all different denominations of the full gospel brethren has fully cooperated. How thankful we are for that. That just shows that when God gets in anything, we can just drop the differences and take right off after God, don't we? <laughs> I believe that's the way it'll be someday when he comes. We'll just forget what we brand we are and take right off after him <laughs> at the rapture. Used to in herding cattle, we used to run the old uh, tripod ranch over in Colorado. And I'd help take the cattle up in the spring of the year, and when we got to the drift fence, I'm sure you brother know what a drift fence is, well, the ranger would stand there and count those cattle as they went through and check them. Now, the ranger never paid so very much attention about the brand they had, because there's all kinds of brands, but he watched for the blood tag was the main thing. Then what brand it was, it had to be a thoroughbred Hereford, or it could not go in that forest for the summer grazing. I think that's the way it'll be at the judgment. He will not notice what brand we're wearing, but he'll watch that blood tag. That, that's on the, all with the blood tag. I'm so glad that uh, I'm cleansed by that blood. That blood cleanses us now from all of our sins. And we stand justified in his presence because of the love of Christ that's shed in our hearts. Now, the services tonight, I thought would be a little night to kind of get acquainted and, uh, with uh, each other and... And then tomorrow afternoon at 2.30, I'm to speak. Usually I don't speak on the afternoon service. Or I have someone to do that. But this time being the service is quickly and uh, just the three days, well, I took the afternoon service also. Now, you that can come out tomorrow afternoon, uh, the prayer cards is give out in the afternoon also. They will, I will be speaking on the next two afternoons on the faith of Abraham teaching. So... We'd be glad for you to come out and enjoy this if you possibly can. And then tomorrow night will be the beginning of the service, 7.30 again. I think that's right, is it? But 7.30. And then I don't know about the ministerial breakfast. I haven't got to talk to the brethren yet, whether there'll be one or not, or what they'll have. That'll be announced from here. And then, then tomorrow night at 7.30, we begin right back again and, and with the prayer lines, praying for the sick, a message before and then praying for the sick. Then Friday afternoon also and Friday night. So we're expecting great things. I go home for just a 
day or two's rest and get my children back to school and, and then I'm going to Australia and New Zealand and through the east. And we're hoping to get back here again and follow the year. Now before we open this book, let's speak to the author as we bow our heads in prayer. Precious Lord, it's one of the grandest privileges that we can think is to come before thee with bowed heads in the name of the Lord Jesus because he has promised that you would hear us. Ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. We pray, Lord, first you will forgive us of all of our shortcomings. We just want to stand clean tonight, Lord, with open hearts, feeling this wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost. May he just get into our hearts tonight and teach us great things. Show us his power to love and to serve and to heal. Get glory out of the service. Lord, we thank you for this great cooperation with this fine bunch of man. We pray that you will bless them exceedingly abundantly. And may this be a meeting that will long be remembered because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon us. Melt our hearts together as one. And may there not be a wheelchair left in our midst when the service is over. May there be no cripples, no afflictions left, no one sick, no one unsaved. May they surrender their life to God, and may God get glory out of all that we are trying to do for for his name. Grant it, Lord, and we'll bow our heads and... Give praise to thee, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Being a believer in the Scripture, I think there's no meeting complete without the reading of the Word. The Word is God's foundation. I believe all doctrines, everything, should come exactly from the Word of God. I believe God can do things that's not written in the Word because He's God. But as long as I know that I'm just following what he said he would do, then I know I'm right, as long as he said he would do it. Now, tonight, I just want to take time, now we really should have at least two or three nights before we even pray for the sick, to get the people instructed, but just three nights to be here, then we've got to do it quickly. Now, I want you to just hold to every word so that you'll be able to understand I wonder if you can hear me all the way back in the back. Well, if you can, that's fine. That's good. Um, That we might get a grip on God's Word because it's essential that we do this. Now, to introduce the ministry, the first, I want to make it real clear that I'm not a healer. I do not believe there is a healer outside of God. Uh, I've just had some wonderful answers to prayer. I pray for the sick. I believe that healing was included in the atonement. If the old atonement had healing, and this is a, a better, so it would have to be better in every way. It would have to have uh, also healing. Now, I believe that all these things that we're enjoying of Christ was finished for us at Calvary, that that told the story there, that he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquity, and the chastening of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. All something in the past, something that God has already done. And it's just our personal faith in a finished work that we get the benefits of his vicarious suffering and death at Calvary. See, it's something that God has already done. And it's just the people on the platform are no more privileged than the one all the way at the back of the building. It's just when your faith believes it and can lay a hold of it. 
And now, divine healing is not the purpose of our, us being here. As I will quote Brother Bosworth. He said, divine healing is like bait that goes on a hook. You don't show the fish the hook, you just show him the bait. So he grabs the bait and gets the hook. That's the way it is by divine healing. When a man is laying at the point of death and then he takes a hold of God for healing, he gets a, God gets the hooks in his mouth. Then he, he sees that God loves him. As the shepherd, the story of the shepherd was told once that the shepherd had a sheep that had a broken leg and he said, what caused that sheep's leg to be broke? He said, I did it. He said, well, you must be a cruel shepherd. So no, I did it so I could show it special care so it would follow me. And sometimes God has to let us lay on our back to look up, to let, it, let us know that he's still God. Sometimes things, the scripture clearly says, all things work together for good to them that love God. And we know the scriptures is true. Now as a preacher, I'm, I'm a spare tar. I, I'll say it with all this around me here. My good friend Booth Cliburn and many other brethren here on the platform tonight who I know are real theologians, and I'm just a Kentucky plowboy, so I'm... Uh, now you excuse my hip, hank, tote, fetch, carry, and all my language. Just remember, I may not know the book too well, but I know the author real well, and that's, that's what I'm relying on is, is the author. So my mistakes, you know, he just overlooks it. Now we want to take the subject tonight, first to read a portion of the scripture found in St. John, the 12th chapter, 30th, or the 20th verse, rather, 21st. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to the worship at the feast. The same therefore came unto Philip, which was of Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sirs, we would see Jesus. Hebrews 13, 8 said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration. And the Scripture is, has got to be right, or all of it right, or there might be that if we could say some of it is right and some of it's not right, then we get ourselves all mixed up. I just believe that it's all the truth. Now, I may not be able to have faith to make it all manifested as promises and so forth to bring them to pass, but I will never stand in somebody's way that does have faith to do it. I might not climb where uh, Enoch did and take an afternoon walk with God and go home with him. I might not have that much faith, and I might not have enough faith to shout like Joshua and knock the walls down, but I'll certainly not stand in anyone's way who does have that type of faith. So it's a very odd scripture tonight. But it's a fitting scripture. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And our reading was that these Greeks wanted to see Jesus. I do not believe there has been any person who has ever heard of the Lord Jesus but what longs to see him. All of us do. I might ask this audience tonight how many of you would like to see Jesus and every hand in here would go up. We want to see him. Then, if these Greeks came to one of his ministers and asked to see him, we know the scripture reading on proves that they got to see him. Then, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we want to see him, why can't we see him then? Now, that, I know that sounds strange. But it's truth just the same. Now, if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's got to be the same in principle, the same in power, all but the corporal body. That corporal body sits at the right hand of God. But the Holy Spirit is back here to manifest Jesus in every way that he lives. Here on earth, he said, The works that I do shall you also a little while the world will see me no more, yet ye shall see me. For I, a personal pronoun, will be with you to the end of the world. Christ 
in us. Then if, if the Spirit of Christ is in the church, it should be doing the works of Christ. Because God set that body aside, the Lord Jesus, his Son, and it was a sanctified, virgin-born body that through his blood he might redeem us who were born after sexual desire and, and corruption that we might be cleansed not by ourselves or through our own good works but through his grace we are cleansed from our sins because he is that offering laying there constantly atoning for our sins we who have confessed faith in him. Therefore we are cleansed by his blood so that his spirit lives in the church, manifesting itself, moving among the members. The works that I do shall he also. I know the translation there is greater than this in the King James, but I believe the right translation be more than this shall you do. For there could hardly be greater. He raised the dead and stopped nature. And he did everything. More, it'd be a universal all around the world in the church. At the same time, where God was manifested in one person, Jesus, now it's manifested in the church universal around. Now, then, that great Spirit, if I said the Spirit of God was in me, I would be doing the works of God. Jesus said, if I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. And I think today we come to the church to find Jesus, and we find our programs in the state of the Spirit of Christ. See, if we went to a peach orchard, we'd expect to find peaches. If we went to an apple orchard, we'd want apples. And uh, we'd be strange to find pumpkins growing on an apple tree. But that's just about how we get it today. We say, well, our, our, our theology is this, we've been taught to believe this, but this is what's truth. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then his spirit in the church moves with his church, his same spirit doing the same works, bringing Jesus to the world now just as he brought it in the form of bringing Christ to the world just as he did in the Son, Christ Jesus. Now, we know God does not change. We want to always remember this, that we are finite. And he's infinite. Now, if God ever makes a decision, ever called to make a decision, and God's decision being he's infinite, he has to continually stay with that decision. See, I can make you a promise. And tomorrow I can say, I was wrong. See, I say, I was mistaken. I didn't mean to say that. I see different now. But God cannot because he's perfect. He knows all things. And his decision, if a sinner ever came to him on bending knees and asked for mercy, and God upon a, a certain merit gave that man pardoning of his sin, the next man has to receive the same. Or if he did not save the second man, then he did wrong when he saved the first man. And if a, a man that's sick ever comes to God and meets the requirements of God. Now, sometimes when we meet the requirements, we think about, well, it's, why didn't he answer? God does sometimes that way upon our action to see what our reaction will be. See? Sometimes, look at the, the Shunammite woman, for instance. See, he wanted to see what her reaction would be. And he does that many times just to see how we'll react. But if we're certain that we have met God's requirements, just stay right with it. He's got to act. You hear it? He's got to act. If he made the promise, he's God and has to keep that promise. He's God. He just can't take it back and say, well, I was mistaken. God makes no mistakes. He's perfect. All right. Now, when God led the children of Israel and the a form of a pillar of fire, the angel of a covenant. Then that same angel was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus said, I came from God and I go to God. 
Well, now we find out when it was here on earth, the way it behaved itself, that Holy Spirit that was in the wilderness with the children of Israel. Now, when we know it was a pillar of fire, Moses met him at the bush, and the bush was on fire. Then the pillar of fire led the children of Israel. And he met him there in the name of I Am. When he was manifested in flesh, he was still, before Abraham was, I Am. A little while, and the world sees me no more. He's going away. I come from God. I go to God. And then after his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension, Paul was on his road down to Damascus one day, or Saul, rather, and all of a sudden there was a light shone around him that blinded him, and a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. I came from God and I go back to God. That was the Spirit in Jesus speaking out. God in Christ manifested. Now, what he was in the days yesterday, living in a body, Jesus, he'll do the same today in his church because that's his program to carry on with his church. Now, if I ask all the Methodists here tonight, uh, you believe that? All of them, yes. Baptists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, and so forth. We'd all believe that. Now the thing that we know the Bible teaches it, but will it work? It'll work if we believe it'll work, because it's God's Word. See? Now, if we can get an idea of what he was yesterday, we can see clearly what he is then today. Now, we was reading just now, out of the book of St. John. Now hold on to these things with all that's in you. We won't have much time to express them in future meetings. But to save time, let's just go back a little bit and find out what he was yesterday. And whatever he was yesterday, he must remain the same today. Now, we find him, we'll go back to the first book, uh, the first part of the book we just read, St. John, and just begin to unfold his life and see what he was yesterday and see the way they seen him yesterday and the way he manifested himself yesterday. Then he's got to do the same thing today. Now, in the first place, let's settle it for all times. Jesus did not claim to be a healer. He said, It's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. St. John 5, 19, Jesus said, Dearly, dearly, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing. He passed through the pool of Bethesda, or by it, where there was multitudes of, uh, and, of people that were crippled, lame, halt, and blind. And he found a man laying on a, well, I'd call it in my country, a pallet. I don't know where the, you California, how many knows what a pallet is? What part of Kentucky are you all from? I thought there's all the Okies and Arkies here, but look like got some Kentuckians here. I was raised on one, so I know what a pallet is. Well, this man was laying on a pallet, a little uh, blanket or something laying there. And when he passed by, Jesus knew that he had been in this condition all this time and healed him and went on his way. What if he did that here in San Jose tonight? Tomorrow morning he'd have the same criticism he had then. Why didn't he heal this one, that one, and this one, and that one? Jesus said, I only do as I see the Father doing. The Father worketh, and I worketh hitherto. Now, let's get back and find what he was. We know of his, his uh, birth in the manger, and a little stable in the side, in a cave on a hillside in Bethlehem, and we know of his part of his boyhood to 12 years old, and then being showing forth 
John the Baptist baptizing him and the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven and then into the wilderness for forty days and nights to be tempted of the devil and then came forth in his ministry. Now follow close. St. John, the first chapter we're beginning with. And we want you to know that the things that you see in here may be just a little different from what you have been maybe thinking about. But sometimes God does things a little different than what we've got our programs worked out. See, God does that. He did that in the first coming of Jesus. He had it, the ministry had it, they had it all worked out some way that Christ was to be. But then he came so different so they did not understand it. And it could be that way again. I don't say it will be, but say it could be. Now we find that as soon as he started his ministry, there was someone came to him by the name of Simon. And as soon as he walked up into the presence of Jesus, Jesus told him that his name was Simon and his father's name was Jonas. Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas. That must have affected that man until we find out that he became later the head of the church at Jerusalem. Thou art Simon, the son of Jonas. There was one standing by by the name of, of Philip, a righteous man, a good man, that became a servant of the Lord Jesus. And later, we find him about two days later making a trip around the mountain to find one of his friends. That was a, certainly a good sign that he'd really got in contact with Jesus. He went after somebody else. The Spirit of God in a man or a woman, if they have really found this great pearl of great price, they'll try to get somebody else to it just as quick as they can. Because it's the Spirit of God trying to call everybody to him. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Now, and Philip, when he went, let's just take a little drama so the young folks will catch it. I can see him go and knock on the door and, and Nathaniel's wife spoke to him and said, Good morning, uh, uh, Philip. Uh, looks like you were kind of tired this morning. Yes, I've run all night. They tell me it's about 15 miles around the mountain. And he said, I come to find Nathaniel. She said, Why, Philip, he just walked out to the olive orchard just a, a while ago. You'll perhaps find him out there somewhere looking over the grove. Must have been a, a farmer. But an honest and just man. And so out went Nathaniel quickly into the grove and he finds, uh, finds Nathaniel on his knees praying. Well, as a Christian gentleman, he wouldn't interrupt him when he was praying. He just waited till he finished. And when he got up off of his knees, I can see him turn around and say, Philip, what doest thou here? Now, they didn't have time to talk over a lot of things like we do. But the, the message was urgent. And if it was urgent, then how much more is it urgent now? Dare you not, how's your farm getting along or so forth, but quickly to the point. Come see who we have found. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Quickly this punch man rode out, straightened up his robe and said, Now wait just a minute. Philip, I know you to be a just man. I know that you're a good man. And it would be it's so strange and hard for me to see that you've gone off on the deep end. Do you mean to tell me that you've fallen for some something like that? That this Jesus that you're speaking of, this Galilean prophet is the Messiah that we're looking for. 
Why, if the Messiah would come, the high priest would know about it. All the churches would know about it. Everybody would know. But I think Philip gave him the best answer that anyone could give. He said, come see for yourself. That's the best way, friends. Come take your scriptures. Take the Bible and look it over. Compare scripture to scripture and see if it's right. Now, we find out then that after he had said that to him, he got ready and along the road he was coming. I can imagine Philip saying to him something like this, Nathaniel, do you remember that old fisherman that you bought them fish from last summer? Oh, the old fellow, Simon, yes. You know, he wanted a receipt and he couldn't even sign his name to the receipt. The Bible said he was ignorant and unlearned. Well, he came up before this one that we know to be the Messiah and he said to him, your name is Simon and your father's name is Jonas. Now, Nathaniel lets us speak, gentlemen, you know the Messiah is to be the God prophet. For Moses, the one we believe, said, The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. And the Messiah is to be a prophet, God prophet, the God of the prophets. But he's to be like a prophet. And wouldn't that just fit him exactly? When this old ignorant fisherman came and he told him that his what his name was and what his father's name was? Philip might have said something like this. It wouldn't surprise me he didn't know you. Oh, now, just a minute. You're not putting any of that. You'll never be able to read my mind. You just wait till I get around there. I'll tell him about it. And perhaps Jesus was standing, maybe it was in the prayer line, or maybe it was just standing talking to the people. But however, when they arrived and Philip came up into the line with Nathaniel, Jesus looked at Nathanael for the first time and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no God. I can imagine Philip punched him and said, What did I tell you? <laughs> is that? What did I tell you? And it astonished this man. And he said to him, What knowest thou me, Rabbi, teacher? When did you ever know me? This is the first time we've ever met. Now, he didn't know him by the way he was... He did not know him the way he was dressed because all the Oriental people dressed the same way. He could have been an Egyptian, he could have been a Greek or something else. I'm told they all dressed alike then. Wore beards and so forth. When did you know me? He said... Before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. Fifteen miles around the mountain day before, yet I saw you. What eyes? Oh, quickly, then this some Hebrew who was called to eternal life fell on his face and said, Rabbi! You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Oh, he believed it because he knew that Messiah was of the God prophet and only Messiah could do that. Now hold that close. Messiah was the only one could do that. And he was looking for that. That settled it. Oh, there were those standing by now that did not believe that. We'll take that up later. Uh, the Jews, the great thoughts from the big high churches and so forth, they were standing by, and not out loud, but in their hearts, they said, this man is a fortune teller, or a devil, and we all know that fortune telling is of the devil, this man is a fortune teller, or maybe he has a telepathy, he, he is a mind reader. He has, he has Beelzebub, the chief of the devils, telling him that. What did Jesus say? He said, you speak that against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven you. But in so many words, to break it down, 
someday the Holy Spirit's coming, and he'll do the same things that I've done. One word against it will never be forgiven. I remember the Jews were looking for him. He was pointing to the Gentile age. That sign was never performed before a Gentile. It was to a Jew and a Samaritan because they both looking for his coming. Now they were taken out then as a nation, but now it's the Gentile's age. Only three, Ham, Shem, and Japheth's people from Noah, which we believe that all, the, all of our human race sprang from those three. Now, notice. Thou art the Son of God, the King of Israel. That's what a real true Jew thought. But the other side said, he's a fortune teller. What? Because Jesus pronounced that horrible thing with no forgiveness, because they were calling the Spirit of God an unclean spirit, doing the thing that the Bible predicted he would do, and then when it was done before him, they said it was of the devil. That was to never be forgiven. Now, remember, we Gentiles in those days were still heathen. We were worshiping idols. We wasn't looking for no Christ. But there was another class of people called the Samaritans. Now, Jesus came to his own. When he sent out his disciples, they go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Matthew 10. Then notice that when he, one day, he, for St. John 4 now, he had need to go by Samaria. I wonder why. See, when God does anything one time, he's got to do it the same the next time. Or he did wrong when he did it the first time. Then if God made himself known through Christ, manifesting like that to the Jews and called out the disciples, in that manner, there was another class of people that was looking for him, a Messiah, to come. That was Samaria. Samaria. And when these Samaritans, when they were looking for him, Jesus had need to go by to see them. And we know the story of St. John 4, when he was uh, uh, sending his disciples in to get some victuals, And then when they were gone in for this food, he sat down over against the well, perhaps a panoramic, something like this. I'm being a Jew yet about 30 years old. I think the scriptures kind of lead us to believe that he looked 50. Because in St. John 6, they said, you mean you saw Abraham and you're not a man over 50 years old? Now we know that you've got a devil and you're a man. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Notice. And here now at this, this cement, the public well, now while they were all, went up there for water, especially the women, to get their daily water to do their cooking and whatever they had to do. All was away from the well at the time, and Jesus, being weary in his way, tired, sat down on the side of the well. Let's just, for, for drama's sake, say he's sitting back in some grapevine, just leaning back, resting a little. And up come a, a lovely woman. Now, she was a woman that we believe to be of ill fame, we Westerners. But she came up to the well to get some water. Maybe she didn't come with the rest of the women because maybe her, the way she was living, we'd say. She couldn't come with the rest of them. And then, yes, as Brother Cleburne said, it could have been the wrong time for her to come. And however, she was came up to the well, and let's say she had a, a water pot on her shoulder, walking along. And she was thinking about something. She hooks the little hooks into the little pot, and she starts on the window to let it down into the well. And she heard someone said, Woman, bring me a drink. And she turned. She had not seen anyone when she was approaching or coming to the well. And she looked and she saw a man 
sitting over against the side of the well. And it was a Jew, and she quickly said to him, Oh, in other words, we got a law of segregation. You, you uh, being a Jew, you have no right to ask the woman of Samaria such a question. We have no mixings, no dealings. And he said, but if you knew who you were talking to, oh, you'd ask me for a drink. What was he doing? Now, you'll have to take my word for this. It's been scriptural to right here. I believe that he was contacting her spirit. The father had showed him to go up there because he said he did nothing till the father showed him. But then he, was, he knew this woman was coming, but now what would be next, he doesn't know. For instance, here, I believe that God sent me to San Jose. Now you're here, but I don't know what next, if it's the Spirit of God. Then after a while, I'll begin to speak to somebody, just like he did. And as he began to talk, she said, oh, she said, uh, we worship in, uh, here in this mountain, you said Jerusalem, and uh, the conversation went on with this man and woman. Now remember, the first time they had ever met. And Jesus said to her, after he found what was her trouble, how many knows what her trouble was? Sure. Said so when he found her trouble, he said, go get your husband and come here. Now listen close, hang on to this. I remember this is the second nationality. There's only three. The three sons of Noah. This is the Jew and the Samaritan and the Gentile. Now these two was looking for him coming. The first, he made himself known by telling Peter and telling Nathaniel and talking to him in that manner as a God prophet that they were looking for. Now here's this woman, we're going to say she was ill-famed, and she's standing there, and she's talking to a man that he just looks like an ordinary man. But she can't catch just what's he talking about. Finally he said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I have no husband. Listen at his words. Thou hast said right. You've had five husbands. And the one you're now living with is not yours. You spoke the truth. Quickly, listen at her. Now where a lot of the great high church members, the priests and high priests, that he's Beelzebub when he did that. What did she say? Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We know when the Messiah cometh, she know more about God than a lot of preachers does. <laughs> we know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. He'll show us these things. Now you must be his prophet. What was that? That, that second... The Jew, now here's the Samaritan, Gentile wasn't looking for it, is their days is coming now. But God, if he revealed himself through Christ to or sent the Messiah in that form to the Jew, he's got to send the same thing to the Samaritan, and so will he to the Gentile. If Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now he said, the woman said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Let me quote it again. We know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us all things. We know that's the sign of the Messiah. When he comes, that'll be the sign that'll be following him, for he is the God prophet, the one that Moses spoke of. But who are you, sir? He said, I'm he that speaks with you. Never was nobody can say it but him. Never will be nobody can say it but him. That's right. I'm he that speaks to you. She dropped that water pot and took off into the well, from the well as hard as she could to the city. And she said, come see a man that told me the things I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? If that was the sign of the Messiah yesterday, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, it's the sign of the Messiah now. One more little thing. Your time's getting away. One more little plug I want to put here before we hit the lessons tomorrow and the next day. Remember, that sign was only given at the end of each generation when they were, were taken away from the God. 
God deals with Israel, of course, now as an individual, but He always deals with Israel as a nation. I believe, isn't that right, brother? And, he, and well, Gentiles as individual, but Israel as a nation. Then He left Israel was blinded so that we'd have a chance to come in. God blinded them. Now look, He closed that dispensation there with that, or that that dispensation He just closed Israel out, blinded them there. The Samaritans, He gave it there. Now here we are at the end of the Gentiles. Let's take what the prophet said. The prophet said there'd be a day that wouldn't be called day or night, but in the evening time it should be light. It'll be light at the evening. Now the same sun that rises in the east sets in the west. Not another sun, the same sun. And when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, it was on an eastern people. We've had a day that we've went across the world. We've had great churches, great revivals, organized, built churches, built places. God never did command that. Never did He say do that. See, the commission was preach the gospel, manifest the power of His resurrection. But now it's come over, this dark day, and now the civilization has come from the east traveling westward. Just a few hundred yards out here, a few miles away, be in the ocean. Then east and west is meeting again. Now the western people, it's their time. And the Holy Spirit is here. And God's duty bound to manifest Himself, just like He did back there to them. Or He did something that one time and did something else to another time. He's got to do it. And He promised to do it. Just to get a little place so you'll see He promised to do it. Before we hit the left, here's the place you'll see. One time Noah, well, let's take it. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot. We'll take that one. The days of Lot. Now listen close, we're closing. As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Everybody knows that to be true. As it was, not as, put near that way, but as it was. Now look, Sodom and Gomorrah was burnt up with fire. And we're taught that the world will be destroyed again. The heavens will be on earth, and the earth will burn with heat. Fire again. I believe these missiles and things that they're sending through this uh, air and go to strike the moon one of these days, just outside the orbit of this earth. I may be all wrong in this. I'm not a scientist, or, but I'm just thinking I read where there was miles and hundreds of miles of volcanic uh, acids and uh, gases gathered outside this earth. What if one of those missiles would happen to set that off? What would it be? Fire in the heavens! And Russia and other places with missiles, atomic bombs that could strike and blow up, holding the ground 175 feet deep for 100 miles square. And thousands of those. I was in a, there's a man sitting right here now, a chaplain out of the army, was just a few weeks ago in Los Angeles where he was talking it over. You used to read and look magazine where that great general said the next war will just be minutes. Some fanatic's going to blow his top one of these days, as we call it, and he's going to pull off one of those bombs that submarines will be rising up out of the ocean and other nations where they got these atomic missiles planted and they'll be whirling one way and the other and the world can't stand it. We're at the end time. We're here at the end. Now, God, go to do this, as it was in the days of Sodom. Always watch your three classes of people. There was the Sodomites. There was the religious world, Lot's people, in Sodom. And here was Abraham out of Sodom, out of the world, living in a place he was the elect. One day, standing in his tent door, he saw three men come walking to him. They look like man. They might have had dust on their clothes. But somehow Abraham, standing there thinking about the goodness of God, when he saw him coming, there was something begin to strike him. It's when we think on God. That's when we see things. That's when things happen. It's when Cleopius and his friend from the... The first Easter on the road down to Emmaus, while they were speaking and thinking about him, that he stepped out of the bushes and began to talk to him. 
It's when we're talking about Him, when we're thinking about Him. We can't be out here running around doing one thing and the other. The church has got too many programs. We ought to get back to God, the old prayer meetings, and, and a real back Pentecost back in the church. We've got too much outside things to do, too many societies to take care of. We've got to come back. Yeah, entertainment, that's right. The American people want to be entertained. They stay home on Wednesday night to see Who Loves Susie or what that program is. That shows what's in your heart. If you love God, you'd be in church. You've got to be back to the church. Back to the Bible. Back to Christ. Here they was. That was Abraham thinking about the goodness of God. Twenty-five years waiting for that baby. And here he was knowing that God was going to do it, and he seen three men coming. And one of them was God. Yeah, this might be, if, I, if I'm wrong here, just do like I do when I'm eating cherry pie. I don't throw the pie away, I throw the seed away, so you do the same way here. Just keep eating fine. The reason I don't be that the is because, and I'll tell you why, the man eat veal chops. He eat a cat at Abraham's slave. He drank the milk and eat some cornbread with butter on it. He wasn't no spirit, he was a man. And Abraham called him Lord, capital L, Elohim. Amen. God. Someone said to me, Billy, you don't mean to tell me you believe that was God? Sure. God called Gabriel and one of his other angels and said, Come here a minute, let's sit down and look down at Sodom. Grabbed up a little handful of calcium, potash, and petroleum, cosmic light, 16 elements were made out of it. Just stepped into it. That's all. That's all God. Sure, it served a purpose. That's the reason I know that someday you'll say, Call our name and we'll come from the dust of the earth. God. Just blowed a little calcium together, stepped into it himself, had dust on his clothes. Walked down there and he was standing, he said, Now two of them modern evangelists had to serve, had to eaten. And I remember as soon as dinner was over, nobody had seen any women yet. This one said to Abraham, said, Where is Sarah thy wife? That was close to the age, remember. Close of the age. Close of Sodom and more. Where is Sarah thy wife? A total stranger. Knowed he was married and knowed who his wife was and what her name was. Said she's in the tent. And the Bible said that the tent was behind him. And he said, I'm going to not keep this from Abraham, but I'm going to visit him according to the time of life. You know what I mean. And Sarah, within her heart, in herself, she laughed. And the angel with his back turned to the tent, and her in the tent said, Why did she laugh? While the modern Billy Graham and a lot of them down there holding a revival down in Sodom and Gomorrah. But this elected church, Abraham and his group, saw this sign. It was the end time. As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. See that sign there just before the time comes? God was going to, Sodom caught a fire after that. And this world's going to leave here one of these days. God's calling to his church. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday. Today and forever. Look at that same spirit when it was put into a virgin born body. Look at the things that it done. Did it do the same as it did there? He perceived their thoughts, called them by their names, told them who they was, where they'd been, so forth. And the real true believers, the elected Jews, believers, believed it to be the truth. Here it is again today, in the last days. Now, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he'll have to manifest himself if I've told the truth about this being the end time. Now, we've had revivals, we've had shouting, we've had gifts, we've had speaking with tongues, and all them things, that's all been the Pentecostal revival. But remember, this was Thomas. Paul said, if you speak with tongues and... There'll be no interpreter to say you're mad, but say when one prophet will say, reveal the secret of the heart, then they'll all fall down and say, truly, God's with you. Do you believe Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Let us pray. O oh Lord, such a wonderful 
spirit in the church, most anything could happen. Looking out across this audience, and well aware that you know every one of them and all their conditions, I pray, Father, that your great mercy and love will be manifested to each and every one. Just a few moments, Lord. Here I'll be before these people and this, the, the clergymen, the ministers of the gospel sitting here on the platform, angels ordained to preach life. I pray, Father, that you'll be merciful and let this church, every sick person, know that you're God and you, you know every heart, you know every secret, you know everything, and every promise that you made is the truth. And we see here that you promised just before the end time, as it was in the days of Sodom, and as it was at the end for the Jews and the Samaritans, they were all looking for your coming. And now the Gentile age is preaching your coming, been watching for years for the coming of the Messiah. Now it's closing down. Is their end coming? Now, Father, we know that your word is true, and let every spirit in here be subject to your spirit, and may you come among us now and manifest your power and your spirit among us, that it might reveal to us that Jesus Christ is not dead, but he is alive forevermore, and lives in his church among his people, walking in and out the door to the sheepfold, the shepherd of the flock. Grant, Lord, that these things will be done for his glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's such a wonderful audience. I spoke just a little long. We won't take, I'll tell you, been this quarter after. We usually are finished at 9.30. Let's just call a few of the prayer line. Each night we call a hundred people about, or maybe more if we can. Let's just call a short group of them tonight. Just because we get out on time, you come back then tomorrow night. Uh, where's Billy Paul? Prayer cards A, 1 to 100 is what he gave out. Now, let's have A, number 1. Let's start from number 1. Just bring a few of them. Who has number 1? Just call it, raise up your hand. Now, it may be somebody in these chairs can't raise up. But to the left, or A, number 1. Would you come right here, lady? Now, if you can't get up, you, just, you let somebody know and we'll pack you. A, number 2. Would you hold your hand? Right here, sir. Number 3. Number 3. Prayer card number three, right here, all right. Number four, who has four? Prayer card number four. I am, now look around, it may be somebody deaf and dumb, okay? or have they found it, all right. Bring the lady right over, number four. Number five, all right, sister. Number six, number six, would you raise, all right, number seven, eight, who has prayer card eight? All right, nine. Nine, all right, ten. Ten, number ten, all right, eleven. Eleven, all right. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. See, one, two. There's another one, number fifteen. Number four is the right, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Three people. There they are. There's two of them. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. 18, all right, 19, 20, 20, move quickly, real quickly, because we don't want to keep the... <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, I want to say that I'm, I'm expecting really something to take place. This is, this is uh, wonderful. Our Lord... Now, how many out there that does not have prayer cards, and yet you're sick, and you want Jesus to heal you? Just raise up your hand so I can get a general idea of where you're all at. Does not have prayer cards. Anywhere in the building. Now, while they're lining them up, just let's wait a minute. The Bible said, the book of Hebrews, that Jesus Christ is now, right now, the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. How many know that? He's the high priest now. That could be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. All right? Then, if he's a high priest now, and if he's the same high priest that he was yesterday, is same today, will be forever, how did the high priest ask, act when somebody touched him? 
There was a woman one time who was coming to a crowd of people, and she touched the hem of his garment. How many remembers that? And everybody was touching, and Jesus turned around and said, Who touched me? And everybody denied it, maybe in an audience that large. Everybody denied it. But he said, uh, Somebody touched me, for, for I perceive that virtue, that strength. In other words, if I'd say it like this now, I got weak. Visions make people weak. I perceive that I have gotten weak. And Peter rebuked him. Peter said, oh, well, Lord, everybody's touching you. And then you come around and say, who touched me? Everybody's patting you on the bank. Saying, I was fine, Reverend. We're sure glad to see you, sir. And all like this. Everybody's touching me. And you come around and say, who touched me? He said, but that was a different touch. And somebody touched me. Now, physically, he could not have felt it because the Palestinian garment hung loose. Now, I think they had an underneath garment, so it would not have, he could not have felt it physically. But he felt it in the spirit because that woman was pulling from God what she had need of. God in Christ was in the fullness, and us is just, a, just by measure. He had it without measure. See? Now, we just had it, we got it like a spoonful of water out of the ocean, and he had the whole ocean. But you see, a spoonful of water's got the same chemicals that the whole ocean's got, but just not as much of it. So these gifts are put in the church to bring the church to God, to let you know, to show you what Jesus died for is your personal property. They have first in the first is apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists, and that's the church offices. We have pastors, evangelists, and prophets, and so forth in the church. All these are done. Then there's nine spiritual gifts that go into the church also. First Corinthians twelve, but those are God called elected bodies sent to the church to bring the church, keep the unity, and keep the church in line and in order. We need it. Now, if Jesus is the high priest and can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, how would you know you touched him if he didn't act the same way he did back there? You'd have to act the same way, wouldn't he? Is that right? You'd have to act it or he, he wouldn't be the same high priest. But if he acts the same way he did then, then you know you touched the same high priest that that was. So now you without prayer cards, you just start and pray and say, Lord, that man don't know me. You don't know nothing about me. But let me have faith. Now, don't get worked up. Just come quietly to him. Just as reverently and say, Lord, I believe and I believe I'll touch your garment. See if he don't turn right around and tell you just the same as he did that woman. Now, if, that, if he doesn't do that, then I've misrepresented him to you. And here, everybody in that prayer line that knows that I do not know you, raise your hands. I know nothing about you. All down along that line, no, I don't. How many out in the audience knows that I do not know you? Raise your hand. There isn't a person here that I know. I, uh, I'm sorry to say, of course, some of these ministers I might know if they'd introduce themselves. The only one that I really can know of right now is Brother Booth Cliburn sitting there. That's right. And uh, Brother Borders. That's the only person that I've seen out besides my boy over here in the corner is the only one that I see in the entire building that I know. But Christ knows every one of you. Now, here they are in the prayer line. Now, if there was anything I could do to heal you, I'd do it. If I know that crawling on my knees and pushing a quarter all the way around this city here uh, with my nose what would heal you, I'd take off to do it. I, I sure would, because if that was God's requirement, I'd sure try it. But it's not God's requirement. See, God has already sent Christ, and Christ died. He was wounded for your transgression. With his stripes you were healed. And the thing settled. The thing of it is now is for you to believe it. It's yours. It's, it's yours. You say, I got saved last year, Brother Branham. No, I beg your pardon. You just accepted it last year. You were saved 1,900 years ago when he died. And, and, uh, see, and you're already healed. Every one of you has been healed since back at that time. See? The devil has no legal rights to hold you. He's just a bluff. That's right. Because Christ stripped every legal power he had when he, when he took it away from him at Calvary. You know that. The, the debt was paid completely right there. So the only thing is just you to believe what he said and accept it and hold on to it. Now, now here we've got all the scriptures and everything laying right out here. Now, will he do it? Now the next thing, will he do it? 
Now you see where I'm standing? I am absolutely going to be found in a few minutes a false prophet or telling the truth. God's going to be found, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, or the Scripture's wrong. Now remember, Jesus said he could not heal. We'll get into it a different night. He did not heal. He only did what the Father showed him to do, what he could see the Father doing. How many ever read that? St. John 5, 19. I do nothing to, unless I see, not hear, but see the Father doing it. Then it had to be a vision. The prophets all did that. When Elijah laid everything out at Mount Carmel, he said, Lord, I've done all this at your command. Everything was laid just the way it did because of his command. Now, I'm your brother. And, brother, sister, I wouldn't be here for nothing in the world as a deceiver. I, I, I love you too much for that, and God knows what about him. See, I'm here. I've saw vision since I was just a little boy. You've got my life story here and all about it. It's went around the world. The picture of the angel of the Lord, that pillar of fire. How many has ever seen that? Let's see your hands. Sure. Oh, they didn't have any more angels' temple tuck at all, and they had enough books to last ten minutes a while ago, a thousand. So that's all they have. But it's in Washington, D.C. They just got noted up here in California a few days ago. It was the most outstanding you've ever seen. What does it do? If I die tonight, the church knows I've told the truth. God vindicated it. The scientific world knows it. George J. Lacey said, the camera will not take psychology. That light struck the lens that was there. See? There it is in Washington, D.C. now and so forth. It's, just, it's the truth, friend. It's the truth. And don't let, no, not me. I'm nothing to do with it, see. I'm just your brother. But you see, in every age, they let these things go by. How about you Catholics back there about St. Patrick? They never know who he was till he was dead. St. Francis of Assisi. How about Joan of Arc? You burn her as a witch to a stake because she saw visions and things. Thought she was a witch and burn her to a stake because she was God's prophetess. See, she is the Beelzebub to you. Then you dug up that priest's body and did it and throw it in the river to do penance. But let me tell you something. It's always that way. It goes by, and you don't know it until it's over. That's the same way it was with our Lord. It's ever aged that way. Now, for you people, you have this lovely spirit. Come right in and believe now while we pray. Father God, it's a, a great moment just now. Hundreds of people are sitting here. They're waiting. Hundreds and hundreds. This is their first time. And here I stand. I don't know what to do or what to say. But thou knowest all things. I pray that you'll help me now, Lord. And may it be so that I could just submit myself to thee. And this audience could, uh, could submit themselves to thee. We could be so committed to God that we wouldn't think our own thoughts. But we would think his thoughts. And may I be so committed to you, Lord, that your spirit would use my lips to speak. My eyes to see, not for glory of man, but that the people might know that God keeps his word, and it's at the end time. And may many repent, and many be healed, for we ask it for God's glory, in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, just for a few moments, everybody reverently. Now, don't move around. Just set real quiet. Watch this away. Pray. Now you without you out there that's sick, it's not going to be in the prayer line. Just look this way and start praying now. Now the woman and I meet for the first time, I guess, in life. Now that's right, so the audience will know way back, just so they see your hand, they can't hear your voice. This is our first time ever meeting. I would never know the woman. I've never saw her. Now here's a picture of St. John 5. Of St. John 4, a man and a woman meeting for the first time on earth. Now, if I go up to the woman and say this, perhaps she's sick, perhaps she isn't. I don't know who she is. Don't know nothing about her. But what if I went up to her and say, Sister, are you sick? She'd say, Yes, I'm sick. Lay my hands on her and say, Glory to God. God heals you. Amen. Believe it. Walk the platform rejoicing. Believe it, you're healed. She'd have a right to do that because the scripture teaches that she's already healed. That would be fine, and that's what, that's what God's been doing for years, but he's God. He wants to get this a little closer to you now. Now, what if the Lord tells her something about herself that she knows I don't know nothing about? Then if he knows what has been, he surely will know what... If he can tell you what has been, you can take his word for what will be. 
if he can reveal the past, surely he can tell the future. Is that right? Now, you do the same thing out there. Just be praying. And after a night or so, when you see the kind of the suspicion, setting, waiting, wonder, anticipation, see, that'll break down. Then the Holy Spirit will just go over the audience and you'll see everything take place. It's your faith that does it. Now, if this woman and I both with our hands up, we never met before in life, never seen each other before, just our first time ever meeting, if the Lord will tell that woman something that's wrong or something about her, I don't know, all of you will believe? Would you just raise your hand and say, I believe, I, I believe. Now, you know it has to come through some power, because we don't know one another. Now, you can be like the modern Pharisee was, say it's evil, then you get that reward. And you can say it's Christ, like the woman that the well did, and got his reward. I just uh, speak with her just a moment because I've never seen her. Now, here's the same thing I thought he'd done to the woman at the well. Now, see, I won't speak with you, but as soon as the anointing gets into the audience and you start believing with all your heart, then it'll go out there. Now, I don't want you to say nothing, but just whether it's right or wrong or whatever it says, and that you be the judge. Now, as we're meeting, just like our Lord and a woman at the well met to, to talk and converse with one another, and he found by some way the moving of her spirit what her trouble was. I believe God sent her up there. Don't you believe that? I believe he sent you here, too. Sure did. For, for some reason, that it's you come. Now, if anyone can notice, if you could see, between me and the woman, there stands that light. Right here now. On right to her. She is a Christian. She's a born-again Christian. She is, and she's suffering with a tremendous nervous condition. That's right. And feelings comes in the evening time. Kind of late, you get weary, weakness from your work. And then you've got something else on your mind that's really bothering you. That's right, isn't it? You believe God can reveal it to me? It's a growth. You believe God can tell me where the growth is? On the breast. Now, you believe that God's going to make you well? If that's right, raise up your hand. All right. Go right. so believing it. That's all there is to it. You go and you want that. Go this way if you want to. Come right here, sister. You believe out there, all of you? I just real reverence. Now, that was at the wet woman at the well. Now, this is a man. Now, Philip went and found, or Andrew went and found Peter, brought him up, or either it was uh, uh, Philip went and found Nathaniel, or one of the man's case, see, like in, in the first chapter of St. John. A man, I guess this is our first meeting. You've met me one time. Just introduced yourself. Of course, I guess that's been some time ago, and I wouldn't know nothing about you. All right, all right. That, here's our first time of meeting. Do you believe that God that was in the days of Philip and Nathaniel is still the same God today? Jesus alive, the same yesterday, today, and forever? If the Lord will reveal to me something that you know something in the past like you did ever what it was. See, I don't know why I say because it's, it's my lips, but it's his voice. You see? He just speaks it. You'd believe, would you, sir? Would every man in here believe if he would do the same? May the Lord grant it. I keep watching that clock. I'm thinking about 9.30. You see, I'm trying to keep that off my mind. You're suffering with high blood pressure. That's right, isn't it? <laughs> now, you think I guessed that? He's a fine man. That's fine as it was. Let's look this way. It's seeming there's something else on his mind anyhow. Yes, he's got heart trouble. That's not all that's on his mind. Something else. There's somebody in here he's interested in. I feel their spirit. Something right here. Yes, it comes before him. I see that it's a woman. That's your wife. <laughs> You believe God can tell me what's wrong with your wife out there? She's got a nervous condition and a colon condition in the colon. That's right. You believe? You believe God knows who this man is? If God will tell you like he did Simon Peter and that, you believe with all and all the rest of you believe? 
Mr. Ayers? That's, that's right. Mr. Ayers, go home. You have received what you've asked for. It's now tends to leave all things at once. The lady singing with the red dress on right in front of that man with the, with the wheelchair there. Put her hand down her lap, looking this way. Got spinal trouble. Do you believe Jesus Christ to make you well? You're healed now. You, what did you touch? The high priest. <laughs> That's right. Just have faith. Don't doubt. See, believe out there just the same as you believe here. God is God. Now, see, she's 20 yards from me. I don't know. The woman never seen her. If that's right, wave your hand over where the lady was. See, there she is right there. Now, I never seen her. Don't know nothing about her. But God knows about her. There's something else happened there at that time. Yeah, the lady's crying. <laughs> you had spinal trouble too. So that's that uh, little what, green looking like her set. All right, that's right. I don't know you, do I? If that's right, shake your hand, hands like this to the people. They know I don't know you. Your spinal trouble's over. When that devil left her, he was screaming for mercy, and that's the reason that screamed out there. You see, when I did bless both of you, now it's a bit of dark over its white over you. You were both healed. How many believes on him now? Have faith. Don't doubt. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Excuse me. We don't know one another. God knows us both. If God will reveal to me your trouble, would you believe me to be his servant? I'm telling the truth, speaking of him. I, I love people, and that's why I'm here to try to help. Well, you're real nervous. You can't hardly eat. You have, that's right. That's true. That's right. And then you've got something wrong with your legs, too. You've been falling, haven't you? That's right. You believe that he's going to make you well now? Just go off the platform rejoicing. It'll be over. Right. 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 If thou canst believe. We're strangers to one another. The Lord Jesus knows us both, doesn't he? I wish I could find that faith like that every night in the first night of the meeting. That's wonderful. Just keep that up. That side trouble you had over there on the end of the road, if you believe with all your heart, it leaves you. You accept it? All right. Stand up on your feet. Stand up, accept it. Trouble's gone from your side. Now you can go home and be well. God bless you. Amen. <laughs> hospital's an awful thing, isn't it? I see you've been in the hospital. You got heart trouble, high blood pressure. You believe you're going to get well now? All right, Mr. Hoffman, you can go home and be well. All right. God bless you this morning. Just go it this way and be well. How do you know who you are? Because he's God. How do you do? We're strangers to each other, isn't we? At uh, just a moment, something happened. There's a younger woman standing here than that. I have to watch. It's a light. I just somewhere in the audience. Yes, right back over here. Hemorrhoids. A lady saying, Do you believe that God makes you well? The hemorrhoids sitting right back behind the wheelchair there and kind of empty your the left there sitting there. Do you believe that God makes you well? Stand up your feet and accept it. All right. Go on. It's all over. Jesus Christ makes you well. What did she touch? The high priest. We're strangers to one another. You believe that God knows who you are and knows all about you, and you believe He could tell me what your trouble is? Would it help you? Is 
sitting right back across the top of this chair here, praying at that throat trouble sitting there. Do you believe Jesus Christ makes you well, lady? Stand up on your feet if you believe it. All right, wave your hand to God and say you accept it. All right, your throat trouble's left you now. You can go home and be well. Well, that's the way to do it. I, what you said, uh, you said, oh, Jesus then was praying. You was praying, God, let him call me. Is that right? Sitting right back there. Well, you had arthritis and you've had gallbladder trouble. That's right. If that's right, stand up on your feet now. You go home. It's all over. Your arthritis is gone. Your attitude towards God makes you well. I ask any of you, anywhere in here, to believe with all your heart right now. That's the Holy Spirit. If that isn't Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, I don't know the Scripture. You believe the Lord, sister, with all your heart. You're aware something's going on. See, that feeling, that real sweet, kind feeling. Isn't that right? If that's right, raise up your hand so people can see. Real sweet and kind. Because between me and you, there's an angel of the Lord. That right. You've got a growth. That growth's in your head. You're scared. If God will tell me who you are, will you believe me? Yeah. Don't, don't doubt. Believe. Mrs. Boyle, go home. Jesus Christ will make you all. Have faith in God. You want to go eat your supper? That old ulcer's gone. Go on over your own resources. Come, lady. What you so nervous about? Oh, it's nervous. Well, it's just coming out time and time for your life. It's, it's going to lead you now. Go home and be well. Jesus Christ makes you well. Just have faith. Come here, sir. You got one of the most dangerous diseases or is heart trouble. But do you believe God will make you well? Or raise up your hands and say, I accept it. In the name of Jesus Christ, go over and be well. Come. Oh, my. Asthma. Do you believe God will make you stop with the asthma? All right. Go on your way. Be well. Oh, rejoice. We can't think of that. All right. A dark shadow is over the woman. Cancer. You believe God will heal you of the cancer and make you well? Raise up your hands and accept Jesus. Go on your own rejoicing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's the way to do it. All right. Believe with all your heart. All right. All right. Come, sister. That back trouble lets you when you come up the platform. Believe it. Just keep on walking. Believe in God. You'll get all right. Amen. No doubt. Not going to Yours also, son. You believe with all your heart? Just start rejoicing there and it'll go right out of your back. Thank God. Come believing with all your heart. Oh, my, here's a baby shattered with death for cancer. Do you believe that God will heal it, brother? Come here. Satan, you evil spirit, challenge you tonight in of faith. This great ransom church of God stands here. You are exposed. You're a devil. And we adjure thee by the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Come out of this child. Don't leave it. Watch it out. Baby, you get well. Just believe with all your heart. You'll do it. All right? You're a little lame with that, but the main thing is your diabetes you're scared about. But you believe that God will make you well? All right. Go on your road rejoice again. It'll all be off and gone. You'll be all right. If you believe. Now you know you're facing an operation with that tumor, but do you believe that God will heal you? All right. Go on your road rejoice again. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to ask you something. When I spoke diabetes to that man, if something funny happened to you, wasn't it, when I said that? Just keep on going believing. If you believe with all your heart, you also can be made well. God bless you. Now, here's a woman shattered to death. Cancer. Yep. That's right. You do it. Yeah. All right. Do you believe that God will heal you? Lord God, come in the power of the resurrection of your son, Jesus, to make well this woman. I ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, I say, wait, we, 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 we bring all the brains on. How many believes with all your heart? If you're ever going to believe, you believe now. Is that right? You believe now. Now, I want to tell you what the Scripture says. Now, you all, to me, you look like it's just kind of hazy out there. You can imagine. If one vision made the Son of God weak, what about me? That's the reason I interpreted that Scripture a while ago. More than this shall you do. See, not greater because there could be no greater. Just more. It's His grace that strengthens us. Now, here's what he said in the, in the closing of his ministry when he was leaving the earth and commissioned his church, going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know the scriptures, St. Mark 16. Now, he said, These signs shall follow them that believe. How many believers are in here? 
these signs shall follow them, please. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. If God will keep this promise, he'll keep every promise. He's God. Don't you believe that? Now, I want each one of you people that's sick to raise your hand. Every person that's sick, raise your hand. Now, if somebody's got their hands up, lay your hands on one another that's sick. Just lay your hands over on each other that's sick. Someone on the wheelchair there. On the wheelchair there. You, if you'll just believe you're going to see something happen like you've never seen before. If you'll just believe it. Now, look. Don't you pray for yourself. No. You pray for the next fellow. The next fellow's praying for you, see. You pray for the person you got your hands on. And the one that's got their hands on you will be praying for you. Now, I'll pray for you all here, and this great bunch of ministers will pray, and then you'll see the glory of God. Now, I wonder, while you got your hands on one another here, if there would be how many sinners in this building that's never accepted Jesus would want to do it right now, believe that Christ is here, would you just stand up on your feet just a minute and let us pray for you? Sinners that has not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and know that this is his presence, and you are backsliders, whatever you are, would you just stand up to your feet just a moment? You who wants to accept Christ at this time, God bless you. Stand up someone else now. God bless you, son. Or someone else. God bless you. Another one. Stand up to your feet. Say, I now want to accept Christ as my Savior. Stand up to your feet anywhere in the building. God bless you back there, sir. Another one. God bless you. God bless you, sister. That's right. Another one. We want to see how many will come to Christ. Look, the Holy Spirit, I was starting to make a prayer for the sick, and the Holy Spirit said to me, call them sinners. A young fellow standing up back here, I know that not might be a minister that will take the gospel. See, I don't know. You just have to obey the Holy Spirit. Stand. Ever who is wanting to accept Christ while his presence is here like this, you'll never be any closer to him until you see him face to face. Stand up. God bless you, son. God bless you. God bless you, sister. Someone else. Stand up. Say, I'm now. This is the first night, but I, I want to accept it. I want Christ to come to me. I believe he's here. And I know if he knows my heart and knows the secrets of my heart, he's the same Jesus that lived in the days gone by. I want him for my Savior right now. I, I belong to church, but really I've never been saved, Brother Bram. I want to stand and say, I want to be saved, born again, filled with his spirit. I want it now. Stand up. Who else? While we're waiting, just a moment. This that might mean the difference between death and life to you, friend. Don't let this pass by. God does these things for his glory. Someone else. Someone else. Just before we pray. All right. God bless you. Way back there in the back. I see it like a family standing. God bless you, young fella. That's very fine. God bless you, sonny boy. That's very fine. God bless you, little boy. Isn't that strange? Them, these little boys, if you're over 10, 12 years old, you say they don't. Oh, yes, they do. Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Such is the kingdom. Their little hearts haven't been pulled through too much stuff yet. They're tender, and they can easily receive Christ. The Spirit knocks, and all they know to do is say, Yes, Lord. I love those little fellows that does that. All right, anyone else, just before we pray now, I see the young lady over here, and a young man and a woman back in the back. I see you way back there, and a young girl. That's fine. God bless you. All right. Now lay your hands on one another, you that's sick. Now, you that accepted Christ as personal Savior, immediately after this prayer, I want you to come up here and stand around the altar where we can pray for you. The Lord bless you. Now, let's pray for the sick, everybody. Head bowed. Now, you pray for the next person now, just like you want them to pray for you. His presence, the Holy Spirit, moving in the building, knows your heart. Feel his glorious presence. O oh Lord, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life, giver of every good gift, let thy Holy Spirit come into this people just now. We know he's in the building. And one time they laid in the shadow of a man called Peter, and they were healed. They've taken aprons and handkerchiefs from the body of another, and they were healed. Oh, Lord, let it know now. Not only the shadow, but the presence of the Holy Ghost is passing over these people. The great angel of God is moving around over this audience here, dipping down into hearts that will listen and will believe. Let it be, Lord, this night, that they all might know that your presence is here. This is a sign. Make San Jose believe it right now, Lord, that it's the end time sign and we're here at the end of the road. 
and Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, is here to minister to their needs. Satan, you have lost your grip. Come out of here. In the name of Jesus Christ, we adjure thee as the church of the living God. Get out of these people. Jesus Christ has defeated you, and we stand as his servant, ministering with a gift that was brought by an angel. Come out. In the name of Jesus Christ, leave these people. With your hands on one another now, every one of you that can accept your healing, that somebody has prayed for you, believing now that God's word is true, I pronounce every one of you healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if you believe it, stand to your feet as a testimony. God bless you. That's right. Just look here. That's the way to do it. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Wonderful. That's it. That's it. God bless you. That's right. Just still standing. Look where the crowd healed at one time. Amen. Look at that. Praise God. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Just still getting up. All right. While you're standing now, lift up your hands and let's sing this song. I love him. I love him because he first loved me. Everybody now. No, I said, let's change it. I will praise him. I will praise him. All right. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. That's what we want to sing. Everybody together now. All right. I will praise him. Raise up your hands if you mean it.
and just keep coming on and You people standing here that's come to the Lord Jesus, that's the greatest thing you've ever done in your life. That's the greatest move that you've ever made. Now look, it's true. Cancer has left this platform from the people tonight. As the nights go by, you'll see lame, blind, halt, withered, everything being healed here. It always is. The Lord does that. But you've done a greater than that. There, you see, you come up here, you raised up, according to science. You broke scientific rules. You raise your hands first. That breaks the scientific rule because you're supposed to keep your hands down. Gravitation holds it down. But there's a spirit in you made a decision. You raise your hands and say, yes, I want Christ. Now, see, what was it? Jesus said, he, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath present tense eternal life and shall never come into the judgment but has passed from death unto life. Jesus said that. We're here to help you. We love you. You're our sisters. You're our brothers. You made the greatest decision that anybody could make is to come to Christ. You come here. He that will come to me, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. You're God. Now you belong to him. Now you bow your head and let's pray. And we're going to ask God. And you pray in your own way. Now your sins, just tell him you're sorry for them. Now he... When you raise up, when you stood up, that you, if you'll stand for him, he'll stand for you. See, it's over. Now let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, these are the trophies of the gathering tonight with the healings that's taken place, the little uh, children and the sick people who have been healed. Hundreds of them, Lord. There's so many here that were suffering with heart trouble and different diseases that I'm positive was healed just a few moments ago felt that great pressure go away. And I know they were healed. And I pray thee, Father, to keep them in peace. And now these come, Lord, for the salvation of their souls. They are convinced when they see the sign of the Messiah, the Messiah sign working in his people, proving that he is with us. I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Forgive them, Lord, of every sin. I know you have. Because no, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And the Father spoke to these people, and they come. Now, Lord, I present them to you as trophies of your grace. Now, they are love gifts that God has given you. You will keep them in perfect peace, whose heart and mind is stayed on you. Now, grant, Lord, if their sins will be forgiven, washed away, may they take a place in a good church, be baptized into Christian faith, and walk after thy holiness from henceforth. Grant it, Father. They are yours now, in Jesus' name, while you have your heads bowed. Each of you now that wants to accept Christ as your personal Savior, believing that he has forgiven you of all your sins, you that stand close, raise up your hand. Won't you? God bless you. That's right. That's right. God bless you. The entirely, the whole entire group has accepted the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. There's workers with you who would probably have a room here for the Holy Spirit. I would advise you as a minister of the gospel, go right in the room there where we can give you instructions on how to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Right to the left there. Someone will lead the way there and we'll go right into this side room here now where we can dismiss the audience and have you in there so we can instruct you. Then join some of these churches. If I lived here, I'd belong to one of these churches. These men represent exactly what I believe. They wouldn't be standing here if they wasn't. That they are God's man and they're here for this purpose. God bless you now. Each one of you. All right? To the rest of the audience now, bow your heads, each one out there in the land. Bow your heads now.